Uh, one of my favorite uh, John Kerry stories when in the election, I want to tell this to prove this point. He, he was talking about stem cells, actually. But he said, if, if George Bush was president, we would have had, we would be using the candles instead of the light bulb. Of course, the buggy instead of the car. They would be using typewriters instead of computers. He gets it all. Because the president didn't do that. We, we use light bulbs because of the genius of Thomas Edison. We use cars because of the ingenuity of Henry Ford. And if the government was in charge of typewriters versus computers, we'd probably pay an IBM today not to make typewriters. And so it, it, it's the ingenuity of the people in the marketplace and what they demand and what they move forward that's made uh, have us to continue to move forward. But it's just not government. I was in grad school in the mid-1990s, and we studied how Apple failed, how Microsoft won, would Apple even exist in the next couple of years. But Steve Jobs figured out he did lose. They lost the laptop, they lost the uh, desktop computer. It was over. So what Steve Jobs do? He says, well, we've got to take the computer off the desktop and put it in somebody's hand. So now people are saying Microsoft is losing. And, and it's just these ideas that keep moving forward that, that our system has allowed to move forward. And, and just one point, and I'll get to the, the healthcare part of it, and it ties in. We had a Christy Romer's economic development, uh, I think the chief economist for the President's administration, and was trying to talk about the stimulus bill in committee, and I was on the committee that oversaw part of the stimulus bill. And she came before the committee, and so I asked her, they said, well, your research throughout your time is how government always tries to manage these types of recessions through spending, and it's never worked. And her research was that, and she's a, a professor at Berkeley. And she said, oh, well, we're doing the exact right amount at the exact right time. And I, and I walked away thinking, so she's saying, basically, they weren't as smart as they were. And it shows the economy is just too big and too complex for people to manage that way. Now, government does do that, right? I'm not an anti-government conservative. NASA and the space did shop. When you have a focus goal and you're moving towards that, government did it right. But now NASA has become an unwilling bureaucracy that doesn't really have a mission anymore. So we, and with the John Kerry example, Thomas Edison did electricity, but the government brought it to homes. Henry Ford built the car, but the government built the roads. With the computer, we're doing broadband and the So there's a role in government for all of this. But when you're trying to manage top down a complex system, it's just you can't, you're not smart enough to make all the decisions and all the ideas, which gets me, gets me to healthcare. It's extremely important what it's, what it's doing to your to your, the profession you guys are moving towards. That's the people we were talking earlier about the pharmacy and what. Uh, groups are, are deciding, and you see they're affecting local pharmacists here in this area. And, and, and the problem with what I think the health care bill that came forward, and, and I didn't support the health care bill, I think the problem was the goal of, of and there were some good things in the bill, about car it was bad, getting people covered that, that had pre-existing conditions and different issues like that we, we need to do. But the problem with the bill is a top-down managed bill. So it gets away from the in, entrepreneurs and innovators out in the world, and, come, and healthcare is starting to shrink or get bigger, where you have smaller entrepreneurs going out of business and selling to hospitals or mega practice and things are moving forward. And, and the, the issues that the healthcare bill kind of moves for that, it, 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 it did. It didn't try two things in law. It was kind of a, a well, a freak of accident. Is one thing it did was the third party payer. We have health insurance through our businesses. Because in World War II we had price controls on labor, so to get people to come work for your business, you said, well, we only can pay an X amount of dollars, and everybody pays that, we'll give you health care. And that's how healthcare, our employer based healthcare system was put together. So it was just kind of a, a business practice to hire people when you had to offer them health insurance. Now it's a law. So you have third party payer, and it also reinforced the fee for service system. So it says, third party payer, you pay for it. You pay for it somewhere, somewhere, somebody's paying for it, but you don't see it when you pay for it. So it says the physician is to do all these services, these, these services, and the person getting them doesn't have to ask how much do they cost. And so now we're having a system where you're, you take the market out of any health care, out of healthcare decisions. And in the physician's events, they have to do a lot of these services because they're, they're afraid of the lawsuits that can come forward. You know, tort reform is estimated to say $54 billion dollars out of the Medicare Medicaid budget alone. That's not the economy, that's out of the government spending in health care alone. So when it's trying fee for service and third party payer, it actually eliminated in a lot, lot to a large degree health service accounts, which was the attempt that came in the nineteen nineties to put the 
dollar in people's hands, they can go buy their health care so they can make some economic decisions about their health care. Now, I was guilty. I had good health insurance when I worked at Trace Icast. I show up. I show up to uh, see Dr. Blaster. He said, I got a little spot on your nose. Let me see me the dermatologist. He goes to the dermatologist. He says, yeah, I think you need to get that fixed and send it to Louisville. He says, you're going to be on TV, so I want to get done with a guy that does kind of a certain kind of dermatology. You know, first time I ever passed one, what you cost? My wife opened the envelope. And I said, oh, wow, I didn't think about how much we owe. That's the first time that the price ever entered into my mind. And so we're conditioned that way in healthcare. So we're, we're taking ourselves out of the marketplace. We are turning over our questions to a certain boards in Washington, D.C., our, 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 our relationships with our physicians. And it's just going to be so top heavy. I don't think it's going to be successful. Now, it may not even be constitutional. That's going to be determined this summer. But I'm, I don't know how it can be successful when you start moving to that direction. And those who are really into medicine here, you have two boards that, that are important to know. Is, one is it's called IPAB, and that is the federal government can make decisions about how much reimbursement will go to, to, to uh, doctors or, or people in the healthcare profession, pharmacists or pharmacists. And they make their unelected, and they're appointed by the president, and their decisions stick unless Congress can overturn them in the law. So what happens now, we have different issues, like we were talking earlier with the pharmacy benefits. Somebody can come to me and say, you know what, people don't understand what this does to our business, and we can offer the same services, and, and, we can, and you have access to your elected official to make that change. Now it's going to be decided by an unelected bureaucracy. There's another one, uh, PCORI, that I don't even know what those actually stand for. It's called Comparative Effectiveness Research. And what that will begin to do is actually tell physicians how they practice medicine. And, and that's something that's very concerning. And, and the, the whole idea of it is this, is we're going to crash in the house of cards with the cost of health care. Medicare, I'm a baby boomer, 1964, 1946, 1964. And Ross Pro said in 1992, didn't he, if we don't get a hold of, of retirement entitlement spending by the time the baby boomers arrive on the scene, we're going to go broke. And Republicans were in the White House. And we've got both parties, so both parties have failed to do it. So you want to pick a party that failed, you can pick either one. So there's no reason to go back and blame anybody because you can blame any, everybody. Nobody wanted to solve the problem. But the issue of this is this. If we don't reform Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security, in 30 years, 100% of federal revenues, 100% of federal revenues, let me show you that a lot federal revenues will be those three programs. Those three programs. So the children of the greatest generation, the children of the greatest generation, which my parents are a little younger than that, but, but I'm baby boomer, so we can, typical baby boomer is a child of the greatest generation, are going to tell their children, this is what we're giving them. You wake up, go to work every day to pay your taxes so I can be retired. So I can be retired. So I'm pointing out flaws in the system, so what are the answers in the system? That's what you want to hear. That's what we need to talk about. We're going to offer that. We offered it last year. We're going to offer it again this year. One of Medicare. Medicare, I don't think anybody. Now, I know just how old Ms. Baker is, so I, I'm not going to say anything. But I don't think anybody else here is over 55, are they? I think you're not over 55. You're not <laughs> if you're over 55, the Medicare reform that we propose doesn't even affect you. We grandfather everybody 55 and older. And the reason we grandfather people 55 and older is because people made decisions to retire based on what they were promised would be there at the time they retired. And so it's not fair to go, well, I'm not going to 91. It would be very hard to say, well, you're going to start paying a lot more for your Medicare because we just can't afford that. I mean, well, I mean she, she can't go back to work. I mean, she has some family to support, but everybody's in that situation. And we said 55, you don't get Medicare to 65 because people are approaching retirement. You could pick 60 new balance faster or 15 new balance less. We said 10 years. But people are 54 and younger. We'll have Medicare, but it'll be a more of an insurance-based plan. And the insurance-based plan will be like I have as a member of Congress. I have. So when you retire, our plan is, say how radical it is, people are saying we're going to throw people away and all that. You hear all the stuff going forward. And all it is, is when you retire, you're going to have the same health care as a retiree that your member of Congress has. And nobody's saying that we're being pushed over cliffs because of the, the, our health care plan. Now, we do pay a $500 a month premium. That'll be, that'll be income-based for people. Some people pay more, some people pay less. Uh, we pay co-pays and, and deductibles. But if we don't reform the system, nobody's going to have it. 
the legend that the average person working in the Urban Institute made 100,000, I'm an average couple, over the course of their working life made 100,000 Medicare. So people pay for Medicare. The average couple takes 300,000 300, spent on them in Medicare. When you have a dozen people working for every retiree, that works. When you get to three retirees, for, well, three more for a retiree, it doesn't work. We're not having enough kids to support that kind of system. I generate some certainly I haven't enough kids to support that kind of moving forward. So we have to reform Medicare. I think the, the, the things that, that, uh, that you get to already in the healthcare system, uh, people kind of managing it from top down. Uh, for example, uh, that, that, that you'll see more of. One, we have generic price, generic drugs, so drugs, so the, and that's, that sounds wonderful. We're going to make drugs generic, generic so they're cheaper for everybody. So drug companies are making things, we're going to make them generic. And we're going to put price controls on drugs. I don't know if there are any oncologists in here today. There's a $4 drug used on pediatric oncology that's in short supply, and oncologists are having to make decisions not to treat children because they can't get a $4 drug. Not because they can't pay for it, because nobody's making it. Anesthesiologists in here, there are people delaying surgery, surgeons in here, delaying surgery because they can't get anesthesia a certain type of anesthesia. And these are, are not expensive drugs. These aren't like the $7,000 treatments that, well, is that a protocol that we need to use? These are everyday drugs that went generic. They put price controls on top of it so people quit making it. Now we're having to go back and try to get factories started back up to try to get these drugs out because it's, it's, it's killing, it can kill children. Another thing that I think is interesting, we're paying in the healthcare bill for uh, electronic health records. I know all your doctors here are having this to deal with. If you didn't before, I like electronic health records. We're paying for three big systems, and none of them will talk to each other. That's the government design. They don't talk to each other. And when I saw that, I said, you know, I remember being in Shanghai, China, with a piece of a car that I could swipe into an ATM machine, and it would go to my bank account and decide I have enough money and spit it back and give me uh, Chinese currency in seconds. You can imagine the government had designed to move that one forward. And that, that's just the concern of all this top-down government moving forward. Um, one other, and I'll, get to, and I'll get to what I think other things we need to do, is medical devices. A lot of medical devices are physicians. They say, well, this would work better if I do it this way. And they come up with the idea and they go to venture capitalists to sell it. Medical devices are now moving to Europe because of a regulatory burden. It takes about seven to eight years to get a medical device approved in the United States. It takes about three in Europe. And I'm not saying going to a third world country, I'm saying three in Europe, because the difference is, Europe says, is it safe? The United States it says it's safe and effective. So Dr. Inslee is going to use a new device. He's got to get approved by the FDA to make sure it's effective. As long as it's so Europe says it's safe, let the physician figure out if it's effective. They'll use hip A versus hip B because hip A is better than hip B, not because there were seven years of studies in Washington for some board to say, okay, you can use that. I mean, these are real issues going on in healthcare today. What we want to do is have market-based solutions. And I think you have to cover pre-existing conditions. You have to let people into the system to get priced out of it. You, you need to let the system work, and then as we as a society don't want people to not be covered because they don't have the money. But what we don't do, I think, is just like we've got the Medicare, which just becomes a blanket free issue where people pay according to their ability to, to pay, and they're subsidized if they're priced out of the marketplace. So we have to let insurance work. Health insurance is now prepaid medical care. It's not insurance anymore. It covers every way. You've heard the big discussions just here, even your, your birth control. Your employer is now responsible for your birth control. If you take, and I don't know this is the religious side of it, but if you, if you don't even go to that, then that matches every employer. It would be a lot cheaper for your employer to give you 100 extra dollars if you go down to the, to the pharmacy to buy it, then you go pay it through the health insurance company, he's going to have to pay it through the pharmacy, he's going to have to <laughs> argue with the health insurance company to move forward. And so what we want to do is get back to basic insurance, that have a plan that people can buy. That says, I want to insure myself against a catastrophic illness and pay for my health care out of pocket as I need preventive care, reactive care, or certain care. Because instead of paying $12,000 a year for health insurance, I'd like to pay half of that. And that extra $6,000 is spent if I got, you know, if I got to go to the doctor and spend $150, I'll go do it. But it's cheaper than paying double what I'm, what I'm paying now. And so we're looking at, and you, a lot of companies do it by buying across state lines. Another is associated health plans. I won't get into all the details of that, but we're, the, the biggest problem with health insurance now is really with individuals because it's so expensive to buy. Let people come together, black businesses. The best example is a car dealer. If you're a car dealer with 20 employees and one has a heart attack, 
then all of a sudden your risk pool goes up and it becomes astronomical if you provide health insurance. But because of anti-competitiveness, they can't come together. Exempt that for, for, for anti-competitiveness and let 100 car dealers insure 2,000 employees and then one or two has a heart attack. It doesn't blow your risk pool. These are, they've been around for a long time. And, and they would make health insurance more competitive and cheaper and moving forward. And we talked about health savings accounts where you, people have more skin in the game by using their own, your own dollar. A point that I tied together and kind of close out, I guess it's a little warm and probably going a, a bit long, but I did think a lecture needed to be a little longer than a speech. The, the point is a lot of you are in your profession, in the healthcare profession, are opposite of what I was describing earlier, where entrepreneurs are out making decisions and deciding things, and, and Steve Jobs says, well, if, if, uh, if Bill Gates is going to beat me on the desktop computer, I'm going to beat him on the handheld and compare stocks to me. But, and, and, and that's happening in medicine. I mean, my, grand, my, my uh, grandmother had a six-week stay when she got a gallbladder surgery. My life was in and out the day. And so the question is, if we start taking away any profit incentive, any, any financial incentive for people to innovate and create these new devices, we're going to lose these innovations and new devices. There's not going to be an incentive for people to do so. And they say, well, they have this equipment in Europe, they have it in other places, but we innovate it all. We do the pharmaceutical research for the world. We do the medical research for the world. We create that medical uh, equipment for the world. And if we don't do it, as they bring in, who's going to do it? And as we get into a top-down managed healthcare system, where all physicians work for hospitals or big groups, we're going to lose the ability for people to innovate and change the system and move it forward. And, and we can change it. And I don't know if the healthcare bill is going to stand this summer. I do really believe once 2014 gets and all of the rules and regulations start coming out, people are really going to be upset about it and demand it. Okay. And unfortunately now people don't want to see it before this next election to make their decision on what they want. But you're going to see it in 2014 when it comes into effect. And I think it's going to have a lot of negative impact on your profession, your chosen profession, and particularly the patients you serve. That's what you're there for. But you also are very smart people. You wouldn't be becoming physicians. And so a lot of smart people are going to say, well, I can make X amount of dollars and deal with the government, or I can go out and do something different and make a lot more money. And we can't lose smart people going in. There's not even dumb people in medicine now. Dr. James may say he's run across a few of them, I don't know, but, but everybody gets there smart. Now sometimes we, we, people make different decisions, but, and, and that's my fear. We're going to lose young people being interested in going into medicine and having the healthcare system that, that's an envy of the world. People will say they're the healthcare debate. Remember that we have the worst healthcare system. You know, we have a lot of the worst health, but where do people choose to go to the hospital if they're from overseas? They all want to come here, though. We have the best health care system. We've got to work on our health. And that's where we get to another solution that we're looking at is paying for the whole person. So instead of fee for service, they keep this person well. I was at Norton Hospital in Louisville, and a lady came in and was getting dialysis. And they said, she's getting dialysis because she wasn't doing, taking her diabetes at best medicine every day. If you tell me I'm not going to. I'm going to be on dialysis, I'll take my medicine, I don't take my medicine, but of course there are people you know in your profession that don't do that. And I said, why don't you just pay her 10 bucks a day and take her med Show up, here's your medicine, here's your $10 bill, I'll bet she'll show up. They said, well, we can't do that. And so we're paying you know, $10,000 through Medicare or Medicaid for her to be served. So those are the things that we're looking at in the committee that I'm on, just got on the healthcare committee, to change and make this better and make our system work better for each person. But the problem, we're going to have to really change the mindset from third-party payer, which is now enshrined in law, and, and the fee-for-service system, where people talk to each other, they work together, and they make the most efficient decision. Because as long as I'm going to get the service and I'm not paying for it, the person who is, be it my health insurance company or the Medicare board, they're going to try to keep squeezing costs. And nobody wants to tell me I can't go. So what are they going to do? They're going to squeeze the cost of the people providing the service to the point they're not going to provide the service anymore. And the health insurance companies tried that, and guess what? They got all these laws passed. They can't do it. Everybody shows up in Frank. Well, all the health insurance companies said I can't do this. I'm the law that they can't do it. I can't do that. And, and that's why these health insurance are so expensive. So we have to be willing to change and innovate the system. Well, um, America is, is a great country. I, I'm a total believer in American exceptionalism. If we don't do it, no one will. We're the leaders of the world. We, we do it because we're government of the people. I mean, I'm, we all, we, 
you know, you're on inheritance by title, by the people you chose me to go there, and for the people I go there to serve to make a better place for all of us to move forward. That's not typical in the world, but it's, it is what we expect here and what we have to make. And we have to make Washington work better, too. It's the way a lot of ladies, all members of, of the Congress and, and all of Washington for not working together to solve the problems. But my, my favorite speech in Washington, and I'll, I'll close with this, was the Australian Prime Minister. Uh, she's probably about 51, 52 years old, I guess, and uh, a wonderful lady. She came and spoke to a joint session of Congress. And as we're all sitting there, I was like, oh, we're going to go through a long speech and joint sessions are kind of neat, but sometimes they get long, and she just mesmerized. And, and what she said, and think about this, this is what she said. She said, what defines America for me in my mind was the time I was a little girl, and I got sent home from school early to watch television. I wish I could do the accent because it's fantastic, but I can't. I'm not even And I'll, I was watching television, and I looked at my mom as she landed on the moon. And I said, Mom, those Americans can do anything. We can do anything. Because we've always depended on not a nation of elites making decisions like other countries have done. We made decisions. We were depended upon what like George Bush called a thousand points of life. But all that was was a point, tried to be a poetic way, not a poetic way of saying every American want out every day trying to make themselves better makes us all better. And that's a system we have to preserve in health care. And that's the commitment I have to you. And I'll congratulate you on your pre-med. Good luck on your med school applications. And uh, if anyway, I can help, I'm certainly willing to do so. But thank you so much for having me here tonight. Thank you.